Hello, here we are. It's tea time with Sean on Thursday the 18th. Uh, we're a little early. We're waiting for Janaina to join us. She is in the uh, forest outside of Sao Paulo. Somebody's stealing my pen. Um, so we are going to wait for Janaina and uh, as soon as she's on, we'll get started. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody just joined from the studio. Mm. Was that Janaina joining or it's just somebody in the studio? No, there was no one. Hello. Hello. Oh, hello. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. It's nice to see you. I haven't seen you for absolutely ages. Callum is know. saying hello to us from a distance. Mm -hmm. How are you doing? Where are you? Tell us where you are. So I'm in Brazil in the countryside. Right. In Bucana de Minas, which is about four hours from Rio in the mountains. And... Um, and it's a place that I had for a long time because my family is from here. Right. So my mother is from here. My grandmother was born in the farm behind me. Oh, wow. So it's a very, very familiar place. It's a good place to be right now. And um, did you grow up there or have you always been going there since you were a child? We, we, we came here every vacation, every weekend. I, so because my mother, she left here at some point right. and and we always you know had the family place so we would come here and spend vacations summer vacations weekends so Jelena, you're i mean just if anybody doesn't know um your mum is brazilian right but your dad is german exactly so where, did, mom... where, did, where did you mainly grow up partially in brazil partially in germany and do, I moved you, to, do you I feel moved, Brazilian or you feel German? Depends what aspect. <laughs> At the moment, I, I'm sure you want to feel German. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I want to run to Merkel right now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I think it depends on the aspects. You know, my dad was German, and I think it's two very different mentalities. Yeah. So growing up in both places... I had an understanding of both, which I think, when I look back now, I think uh, it, it was maybe confusing growing up because the question of, you know, when I was growing up in Brazil, I looked like my dad, so I was a, a German here, and then of right. moved, we moved to Germany, and I still had an accent, and my German wasn't as fluid, so then I was a foreigner there as well, so I kind of felt like a foreigner in both places until I moved to New York and didn't feel like a foreigner anymore. And do you, do you think that that notion of um, being from, from two cultures uh, informs your work in any way? I think it does. I think it does. I think I have to say that mainly, I mean, I went to Art Academy in Germany. Yeah. So my, my growing up into the art was in a way tinted by Germany really educational and you know my my conversations and how I started to read art books and see things was you know with a lot of like German art history in the background surrounded by professors in the academy in Hamburg so I think there is a lot of uh, reflection about German art history European art history in general and but it was always informed by this other mentality that I grew up as well. You know, my mother, she studied literature. She used to tell me a lot of stories from Portuguese literature, Brazilian literature. And so there was both, I think, in place. And this place here particularly, I think, influenced me a lot in my childhood because it has a, it's a very... It's very isolated. It has a lot of stories. It's in the mountains in Brazil, so it doesn't fit exactly that image of Brazil that sometimes there is outside of like right. the tropics and the 
it, it's quite the opposite. It, could, it can be quite dark. It can be quite mysterious. And there's a lot of literature that came from Minas Gerais. And yeah. so yeah. for me, I think growing up partially here as well, and my mother being from here, there was a whole another aspect that informed my, my process. How, how far outside of Sao Paulo are you? I'm about six hours from Sao Paulo. Wow, so it's quite a distance. Yes, it is. And it's how, all uh, dirt how, road. How, how often do you manage to get down there? Well, I come here every summer when my daughter has a break. We stay here. We try to stay here one and a half month at least. And I didn't have internet until now, really. So it was a different kind of isolation, you know, than, than we're living now. But, you, you know, when you went, I mean, I have to say it, it was sort of, you left New York as New York was going into really a very difficult moment. Uh, and I know that you wanted to get out because you were concerned about Mina, et cetera. Um, and then you left here and it seems like you went from the frying pan into the fire because obviously the situation in Brazil is so bad and worrying. I know, I know. Um, and I mean, how, how, how are, you, are you concerned about that? Because you probably couldn't even get back here if you wanted to right now. Right now we couldn't get back and I think the situation here is still escalating and I'm definitely, you know, between going away from New York, Trump, and arriving here with Bolsonaro. Yeah, you know, I mean, you, you know, I'm, I'm not sure which one is worse, frankly. It's, it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell. But Bolsonaro, I think here, my, the situation here, also where I am, as, as, as much as it looks like, you know, a paradise and it's so far away from everything it's even more worrisome because the little town has very small structure there's no hospital and yeah. the care and the worry about covid getting here yeah is is is, is very you know it, it's very frightening the idea because yeah. obviously we can't rely on the government we can't rely I know, so we I know have that, to kind of self-organize really yeah i know the minute you arrived you know there you you told me that there was some sort of uh, concern that you'd come from New York amongst the local people. And then you were the one that was saying, we have to prepare for this. We have to do something. We have to make masks. We have to get ready. And I'm sure that their attitude now has changed a lot towards, you know, towards your, um, actually your community efforts to get them organized to prepare for this. Yeah, you know, I mean, I have I have a lot of family here, so people know me, so it's a bit different. But still, I was coming from New York, and there was this fake news that came out that I was bringing COVID here, which which was very hurtful to me because obviously I, I had a giant concern yeah. not to come in here sick, and we stayed quarantined inside the house without meeting anyone or going even into town before, yeah. you know. So... And now there is a solidarity, you know, I, we did this project creating masks for yeah. the community and there is a solidarity about informing each other. I, I met the mayor last week who was informing me that he, even though he's being pressured to open up business, he wants to keep it closed. Okay, there are yeah. barriers. So it, it feels good to be working, you know, together with, with people you're thinking they are all, you know, my family. I have about, I was counting the other day, I have 36 first cousins and I have wow. 100 and something second cousins. That's an so entire that's, community right there. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So it, it is very important to be reflecting about that, you know, how, how, how also, you know, just like fleeing your home and going somewhere idyllic, that's, that's it's not that I, the idea, you know, it's, it's really, I think, engaging. Now, I have to say, one of the most amazing things I've seen uh, happening in a studio uh, during this period, which is so extraordinary, uh, has been when you arrived there, immediately you started painting. I mean, I'm sure it was the night you got out of the, the truck that you arrived. <laughs> You got some paper and you started painting and the paintings looked so different to what you've been working on before. 
they immediately, I mean, so beautiful, but they immediately reflected the landscape, the environment, the space that you were occupying. And you've been just kind of pouring out images. Is that for you some sort of cathartic way of dealing with the moment? I think it is because definitely for me, painting is, a, is, is the way I express. So it's, uh, it's, it's all the protest, all the anger goes inside the brushstroke, really, and goes inside the, the dialogue between the drawing and the painting. So for me, coming here was a, it was great to have that way of trying to express and deal with the situation because obviously we're all going through this strange isolation that seems watched because the internet invaded us all all of a sudden so i yeah. think also in terms of the freedom to express something <clears throat> with my hands painting and to create my own universe there without surveillance seemed like a, a very special place and i need that place because i think right now one of my biggest fears is to be surveilled somehow. You know, we, I, it feels like we're in isolation, but isolation is not the problem. Right. I feel like the problem is a surveilled isolation yeah. because every single move we do has been watched now, like even yeah. our conversation and who's around us. And the, the studio for me is, a, that's why I don't have the Wi-Fi in my studio and we can't be looking at my paintings right now is because I don't want the Wi-Fi there. I, I, yeah. I, I, I do want to keep that place as my place where I invent my expression, my ways, my communication, where I have a voice that has no limit. We, we, we got some really great questions for you, which I'll get to in a minute, but I have a question I want to ask you. I mean, we've known each other quite a long while, but we haven't worked together for so long, a number of years now. Um, I've always been a big fan of the work but since I've gotten to know you better and been able to come to the studio more often, you strike me as somebody who is just like, you know, I, I mean, you don't produce that much work, but the work pours out of you. It's almost like a fountain that you, you know, I, I can't imagine you not making paintings. It seems to me to be so much a part of the way that you express yourself. And I wonder, did you, or, you know, is that something that you have come to do by being more comfortable with it? Or is it something that you've always done? Has, has the work always come very naturally to you? It, it has. I painted, I always painted. And it was always for me a channel and a, a way of expression and, and that space of, of complete freedom. And so <clears throat> I, I guess with time, the tools and the dialogue becomes more clear. So if I go to the studio now, I feel like I, I know already what I want to tell the, the canvas. I, I know how to start the conversation where maybe before there was a struggle that was bigger and now the voice and the gestures and the signs, they become more fluid. So that this conversation in a way is right now very much alive. So I feel like the studio calls me in to continue the problem. So you, you, you know, in that respect, you're very fortunate. You, you can literally arrive, put a piece of paper in front of you in a very different environment. I can imagine you doing it in the Arctic or in the Brazilian rainforest. And, you know, things will, these images will come forth for you. You're very fortunate in that. But I guess in one sense, it could call up another problem. And that is, how do you how do you qualify, you know, how do you quantify moving forward? Because if it's so natural to you, you could do it anyway. But of course, one always wants to learn and move forward and improve the work. So what's the benchmark for you about how you move the work forward and improve it? I think every painting that I work on, I'm reflecting on certain aspects. And I think that I, I'm the whole time in a way, watching how I am improving in, in grasping a situation in the painting or how I manage to, 
to go over a hurt that I impose myself. Because, of course, I have a whole dialogue in my head that I want to solve. And if I'm interested in how, for instance, I can actually uh, work on my, on my brush stroke so that it converses with the drawing more. Or I, I feel like every painting shows me a problem and shows me a solution. So I, it, does I, it does it also show you very clearly your personality, the mood you're in when you're making the painting, your psychology? You know, is that also shown very clearly in the work for you? It it does show, it does show, but I try to balance it with all this other. Like it, there is a bit of a, obviously there is an emotional impulse, but I think with the years you you try to, in a way, understand it. And, and impose it also with a conceptual part of the work that is of interest to me right now that I'm trying to find out about. And it's how, very... Sorry, I interrupted. I was, I was going to ask you, how is that changing at the moment? I, you know, whilst we're all isolating, I mean, how is the outside world, those pressures coming in? How do you feel they're coming into the work right now? I think it comes... It comes in, it, it, I feel like the expression right now that my drawings are becoming almost more aggressive or the dialogue between, you know, the, the canvas, the painting and the drawing is a bit more aggressive or more demanding so that I want to get into a bigger space where I express and find my voice even louder. And I think this has to do with what's going on. I think it's a protest that is happening in the canvas, which is something that I feel right now that I'm afraid of um, this su surveillance and of being cornered into a place of fear right. by what's going on. And I, I want to rebel against it and I want to keep my freedom and, and, and not be afraid. So I think that sort of translates in a in an even more aggressive tone in the painting obviously uh, if, if you're really upset by something or you're really pissed off or you're really angry um do you find that you just can't work or do you channel it into the work i do try to work but i do try not to let that also um control my work Right. And I think this is the challenge that I sometimes need to find a balance. Because you, I, can't, uh, you can't just paint when you're happy. I mean, it's like... No, absolutely <laughs> not. And actually, sometimes the painting, when you're angry and frustrated, it, you, you, you lose fear of being something pretty or of being so, nice. So you, you really go for it. So you go for it. So listen, I, mean, I, I, know, I know that I'm, I'm probably going to get heavily criticized by all your Brazilian people that are watching today, your friends. Um, this is a very cheeky question to ask somebody in Brazil, but it is supposed to be tea time with Sean. And I've got my tea here. Have you got I a cup of tea? tea have you got a cup of tea there? Oh, my God. Look at you. You're so good. I have what my sort, herbal brew. What, what sort brew. of tea are you drinking? It's a herbal brew. It's, some, it's like a local... It's not Man. like Ayahuasca or something. We're not going to nope. lose you halfway, <laughs> halfway through the interview. <laughs> no, it's something to keep, you know, make myself calm. <laughs> okay, good. That's a good thing. Not that you're going to start tearing your clothes off and running into the forest. <laughs> no. So I have my tea. And I would love, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. We, I, can I switch and show you a painting that I love very much? Here, oh, I love I you too. Yeah. Send that oh, my God, you. that's beautiful. Where, because, where is where is that? Is that so? This suit? is my studio upstairs, right? You know, but it wow. doesn't have internet, so I can, I have I took a picture and I'm bringing you guys to this painting because oh, as, we were, as we were what, talking about um, brush what sort of scale? What what sort of scale are those, Janaina? This is about two meters by one fifty. Cecile's already commented. What a beauty. And when Cecile <laughs> says that, she means we want that painting. <laughs> we have to figure out how to transport from here. I, I'm Quite. sure she already had that typed out, ready to press the button. <laughs> <laughs> but I think for me, what was interesting coming here is that relationship. Because obviously in Brooklyn, where I paint, 
it's a warehouse district, you know. Yeah. I I walk through all those warehouses. There's no green, almost no tree, and I walk into a studio that is a used to be a <laughs> warehouse and is white. And then I came here and I I have, I'm bombarded by green and by landscape. So obviously that changes things around, but I think it makes like now I've been here for three months and right. and I'm really looking for what's underneath the the leaf, not at the leaf anymore. It's like not this, on the surface. You're you're behind it, underneath it's, it. It's it's behind it. It's the stories, the the mood, the isolation, and I think that crawls into the painting. I can't. It, it, you know, it's super interesting because I've been noticing. We've been emailing and texting back and forth over the last thirteen weeks, and. Um, in the last couple of days, when you've texted me and we've, we've gone back and forth, you've started talking about stories and ghosts. And I've, no, I've, I've Say noticed... Say again, that sorry. Was... You, you, you've started referencing stories and ghosts. And it was interesting to me that you were starting... That obviously, there's this kind of uh, undercurrent creeping into your thinking about the work. Where's, where's that seeping in from? Well, this place here has a lot of stories and has a lot of ghosts. I think the the way this place is isolated, it's still, I mean, there's dirt roads, there's not access to every place. So people that live in the countryside here, they live off stories and they also believe in them. You know, the isolation here is also, there's a fear factor. People are afraid of the woods. They, they come up with stories to understand certain things. And I right. think there's, a, I mean, there's a reason my mother ran away from here, you know, to be able to get educated and to study because for a woman at the time, it was absolutely impossible. The woman was in the house, inside, doing the, the work without any education. So I think there, there's a lot of stories that creep around that place right. and are very intense. So, of course, now I'm back connected to my family here, to some people that, you know, live close to me. And, and it's, it's starting to creep back in. I see all of it, you know. Yeah. I see all the stories and I can more, and I can also understand more being isolated here, where they come from. So, um, that, that's a very good segue because we had some questions before and one of them I particularly loved. Um, somebody had written and, and asked, they said, your works portray dreamlike landscapes. Is there a narrative component to your paintings? And have your dreams changed much during lockdown? That's a wonderful question. I think the dreams, they change a lot because I mostly have insomnia. So I'm not dreaming. <laughs> You're not dreaming at all. <laughs> it's been a little hard. But I think really, I. I've been having insomnia again. I think it's just too many worries that kind of sleep with one. And uh, But I think, yeah, I think especially this isolation, I think thinking about that, the ways that we used to be isolated here because we didn't have uh, access to certain things. You know, it just made me think about also privileges and how people in different places, but in any way, in regards of of the paintings and of the landscape, it is more what we had talked about that I think the voice gets louder as also we start to realize, you know, that we have to fight for our freedom and for our identity. And I think this is something that I want to be able to translate into my paintings right now, that there is a, that there is, you know, in a way also no fear that, that are you know that we are going to continue to express and talk and louder maybe well maybe that comes from you being between two cultures where you know if effectively the leadership of the countries right now is very much about silencing individuals voices and trying to impose some sort of fascist view of the world and artists have always been a font of defense artists, writers, intellectuals have always been a font of defense for moments like that. And it's incredibly important that whilst all these terrible things are happening, um, that artists are really thinking about 
about this moment and figuring out how to, ref how to refract it and how to reflect it. Not just literally, but actually how to resist it, you know, and provide some resistance. Exactly, exactly. So um, I, there was another question here, which I thought was fascinating. Um, somebody wrote and asked, the ocean and aquatic references in your works are very strong, particularly in your films. Did you spend a lot of time near the water growing up? And where does, you know, where does that come from, do you think? I mean, I think there's a fascination about the ocean, obviously, because it is a space that we didn't control yet, that has its own rules and regulations, and that it had, and that mysterious, um, obviously, underground and, and undertow always interested me. I, obviously, here in Brazil, there's a lot of um, culture and uh, uh, references to the ocean. There's sure. a, a water goddess so in 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 that perspective i was interested to understand you know uh, when the ocean is female when the ocean is male in different languages is always a different thing so but the ocean did always attract me a lot and i think but you, didn't, you didn't you didn't grow up next to the ocean you were you know you weren't a beach I was baby, a, a beach baby in rio i mean I was in Sao Paulo, really, when I was small. Then I moved to Rio, but I wasn't like a, no, like a beach rat, like being on the beach all the time. Right. I always wanted to surf when I was little, but it was still not the time when girls would go surfing so much. Do you surf now? No, but I'm trying to learn. Cause I still... take, is, is Mina taking you? M Mina is surfing already. Mm -hmm. she, of course. I knew it. <laughs> but I think those this um, freedom as well. I mean, I was always very enchanted by the work of Bastian Ada, the yeah. performer, and this last piece of his, you know, in sure. search of the miraculous, that he took the little boat into the ocean. Yeah. Because it, 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 that performance really touched me so much because that search of the miraculous, that search, this is what the ocean and the horizon was always standing for for me, you know, that sort of immense freedom and and being in a place that is not controlled, being in a place where things move, we have diff a different body weight, we can flow, we don't know what's in the deep. So there's a lot of layers of interest that surround the ocean for me. Well, also, it's a pretty immediate way of being confronted with the fact that you know, once you put yourself into that situation, you are absolutely no longer in control. The ocean is such a, a vast and powerful environment and that we're so small by comparison. I mean, it is a very quick way of confronting yourself with your own limitations. Absolutely. But also I think for me, there was something soothing about the ocean, which in a way I felt like in, independently where you are in the world or who you are or where you are culturally or economically the ocean is an invitation and and a place to be and the beach it's, it's also a very egalitarian it's, it's a very egalitarian space in many ways i mean you can uh we used to be able to get out of a plane in you know new zealand or uh malaysia or britain or anywhere and be in the ocean and the ocean was a very egalitarian space in many ways. It's very familiar wherever you are. Exactly. It's just a I think that that is also one thing that I am fascinated. I mean, the beach, people are in their bikinis. There is no difference, you know, people, they, everybody goes to the beach. It's a very social, common place, you know, people interact without yeah. having to be on. Sometimes you meet, you have friends that you meet on the beach, you, you don't know what they do professionally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, the, the, these, these days it'd be a bikini with, with a face mask, so it'd be more <laughs> difficult. <laughs> so let me, let me ask you a couple of very quick questions. You're not allowed to ponder these, you have to okay. respond very quickly, okay? Uh, and the first one's very stupid because I can't even imagine that there's an alternative to this. But if you weren't, if you weren't an artist, what would you be? Biologist. Biologist. That makes a or lot of sense. Marine biologist. Marine that make, biologist. That, well, either one makes a lot of sense in terms of your work. So that we're not straying too far. What uh, what 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 meal would you like to go out and get the minute you are no longer quarantined? 
I would like to go to a Japanese restaurant, please. Mm. <sighs> Sushi or tempura? Sushi and oysters. Okay. So yes. it takes us, takes us back to the ocean? <laughs> so uh, what, what, what are you reading right now? I was reading a book about um, Alexander von Humboldt. Oh, it's a oh my God, you, you really are interested in biology. I am, I am, and I love this. It's a biography about him from Andrea von Wolf. So it's a, it's a narration of his travels and of his discoveries of, you know, that I think that relationship to nature and climate change. So it was very, actually uh, amazing to, to be here and read it. And what, what music are you listening to at the moment, apart from your great friend Bebel? Well, I listen to a lot of punk rock in my studio, very loud. But it's really? That, 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 last week, Chris Martin told, told me he's a metalhead. Where is all this coming from? <laughs> I mean, I, I do listen to also a lot of Cat Powers, which is a little softer, and right. Chet Baker, and classical music. Also okay, so we got punk rock, <laughs> Chet Baker, Cat Powers. I mean, this is quite a mashup. <laughs> I know, but I, th I have to say, I think I grew up in that punk rock generation and it's still very much inside of me. I mean, so I can't So who are your favorite, who are your favorite punk rock bands, bands to listen to? I love Sonic Youth, you know, I, it was one of my first concerts when I was a teenager. Right. I went to see Sonic Youth, I went to see Nirvana, Smashing Pumpkins. You know, so it's a mixture. Oh, I, that's not that's not punk rock. I thought you were talking about the Sex Pistols, the Damned, Susie and the Banshees. I came a little after the Sex. It's a that's yeah, a little later. That's it's a, kind a of, little later. It's I'm already later. much more. It's already much more lyrical. It is more lyrical. It is not. Yeah, it's not Sex Pistols, but I still yeah. do listen to Sex Pistols too. Yeah, well that's okay. We we love them too. <laughs> we love Sonic. Yes. Good. Um, okay. Uh, and what, where would you choose to go? If you could get on a plane right now, where would you go? I, right now, I wouldn't be ready to go anywhere. I love being here right now. You'd stay <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah, I couldn't even imagine, but I think maybe I would like to go to a place that is even more isolated. <laughs> <laughs> six, hours in, six hours out of Sao Paulo in the jungle, and you want to go to somewhere more isolated. The ocean this time. I would okay. like to go to the uh, ocean. Well, maybe that maybe a, a, a one-person island in the Maldives. <laughs> yes, something like that. Yeah. Um, so when are you going to come back to New York? What, what's the plan? The plan is going back mid-August. Oh, okay. So in about two months. Let's hope things are possible by then. You know, yeah. we're going back because Mina also has her school and I do miss New York and I miss my friends horribly, yeah. I have to say. And, and I miss supposed New to York. say you're missing us, not your friends. I miss you <laughs> see you in all the galleries. <laughs> what, what, what's, what's, um, are you seeing, are you seeing um, much of Marcia while you're there? I saw Marcia and Cecile were fighting I over the paintings <laughs> earlier, which was, which was great to see. Marcy is putting a claim on them as well. Good for her. They're great. Um, have you been seeing much of Marcia? How is she? She is very well. She is. I wish I could show you. She is. Oops, sorry. She's right there in that other hill. Oh, great. So it's a bit. It's a. It's a walk. She and so we don't. You can, see you, you, can, you can wave flags at each other. Exactly. Oh, perfect. She's the other hill. Yeah. Nice. nice. Give, her, give, her, give her our love when you see her. Yes, absolutely. There, <laughs> there she's commenting. There she is. Very good. No, it's been nice because we can have good conversations and, and walk around a little bit. It's nice to be in this kind of environment also, you know, talking about art and talking about ideas. Yeah, and not, perfect. Because yeah, it's nice not to only be in the COVID yeah, for sure. You know. uh, how how many people are are sort of in your what what do they call it? Like a pod now. We've got COVID pods for God's sake already. Right. Quarantine, 
quarren pods, Lauren's telling you. We well, have quarren pods, terrifying. Massive. Who, who's she's in a, your quarren pod? So in my quarren pod, you know, Mina just left. She went to stay with her dad in Rio for some weeks. Yeah. So, and I have right now, I have Massa across in the house, but I have two friends that I r arrived that did the test to come here because also we want to work on a film project together. So we're going to be right. six people here in my pod working on that movie that is about isolation and happens in the, in the, in the woods. So it's a story reflecting all that. So the, so they are come there. Two already arrived, two and another two friends are arriving. So we'll be six people here, which is quite nice. That's nice. And, and are you cooking? Do you like to cook? We, I love to cook. We cook every day. What I'm missing is that I cannot go to all my cousins' farms all the time, you know, to ask and to exchange vegetables and chickens and eggs. Well, they could so, leave them. They could leave them on the perimeter for you to collect, steal out in the night, and pick them up. Yeah, but you know, here there is a personal thing that people are yeah, very yeah. fond of. So, but I, I cook every day. I have a stove that is a wood burning stove. Oh, fantastic! And I have a vegetable garden, and I have chickens and eggs. Very nice. You're all set up. You can stay there forever. You don't need to come back. <laughs> I know. Maybe the guy here. <laughs> ba ba basically, these days, I think the question is, why would we go back? I mean, if you've got that kind of setup, I mean, you know, you could homeschool Mina, and you've, you're you're all set. You've got chickens, eggs, vegetable garden. You know. I know. I've been thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think too much about it. <laughs> Coming back in August. I'm coming good, back. In good, August. good. And what, uh, uh, Janaina, what's coming up? What are you working on for the fall and beyond when we get back out into the world, whatever we find when we get there? What projects are coming up? Well, right. I mean, I have a, I have a show at the Orangerie in Paris in October. Oh, ex excuse me. Excuse me. So you, that I'm very you and, you and You and Monet. Me and Monet, it's a conversation with Monet. I'm glad he's dead, he's dead so I, can, I don't have to be afraid of him. <laughs> well, no, so he's, you, you, you can dominate the conversation. You won't get a word in. <laughs> but no, I'm very excited about that. And I'm very happy Fantastic. that it's happening. And when is that? That's going to be October 19th. Open. Wow, fantastic. So I'm hoping and, to be and, able to uh, fly uh, to Paris. Yeah, or, 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 or I could do a, a, a Bas Yanada and take a, take a sailboat. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, do you, have, you, have you been asked to respond to Monet particularly or to the building or the setting? Or what, what's, the mean, nature of, what's the nature of the invitation? It, it's called counter, uh, Counterpoint. It's a dialogue with the water lilies. So it is a... It is a specific invitation in a way because there is a space in front of the water lilies that used yeah. to be a resting place, like a space just to breathe before you go in. And they started to do this program of inviting an artist to have a dialogue. So there's two spaces, one in the basement floor and one on the, on the first floor where the water lilies are. So yeah. it's two base. It's a common in a way. I, I, are you intimidated by that? Because it's a bit like being asked to sort of do a project in the ante room to the Rothko Chapel in Houston, isn't it? I mean, it's not exactly light lightweight. I mean, you've got a bit of competition there, haven't you? Really? I know, I know. And I felt I felt quite intimidated in the first idea, you know, in the first like thinking of it, and then. But then going into the drawings, into like all the reading, reading myself into it, I started to develop, you, you know, also a wish to sort of think and draw and, and, and create a dialogue that would right. interest me. So I created, you know, the, we are uh, showing a video piece that I did in 2005 that is called Blood Sea. It was shot in the water that has a direct relationship to the water lilies. Yeah. And the curator, she was very fond of it because she worked with that piece when it was at the at the um, at the museum shown. So 
now I created a drawing that also, in a way, talks about the video, but has this dialogue. Because I've been I, I, drawing like crazy since September last year, just to kind of find myself in a space where I can talk to Monet. I have to say, if I was Monet, if I was Claude Monet, I'd be a bit worried about you turning up in my house with your paintings because, you know, I think you're going to give him a run for his money. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But what, very, a lovely, very... what a lovely invitation. It is, it is. I'm super happy about it. I'm happy that it's happening also. And, yeah. and that okay. would be probably my first trip, you know, in connection to work. Yeah. Outside. Yeah. Well, listen, it's a perfect place to uh, finish. Uh, it's been so much fun having you on, and you're such a natural. I mean, it's been such an outpouring of ideas and responses. Uh, it's so great to have, have you on. It's lovely to see you, and we can't wait for you to be back in New York to actually see you in person. Yes. And, uh, and, and I just, as a, as a final word, I just want to tell Marcia, she may be on the other hill, but she's not getting all those paintings. So. <laughs> I will tell her she's probably listening right now. <laughs> she's watching, trust me. I mean, she's probably, she's, she's probably got somebody running over there now to take them out of the studio. Anyway, it's lovely to see you. Thanks for Love joining us. Lovely to see you too. Can't this wait. Really Can't fun. wait to see you all. All right. That, take... Thanks, Janaida. Okay, thank you. Big hug. Take, take care. care. Bye. Ciao.